provides an opportunity to greet Grove College students, faculty, staff, and our community members to increase awareness regarding local and global issues integrated in our world, allowing us to examine and discuss these issues. I would like to extend special appreciation to those involved in the Tan Tannenbaum Sternberger Foundation that make this series possible. I would also like to recognize some special guests in attendance today. Coach Lamb, John Beresdorfer, and Jim Dodson, will you please stand? Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. We're appreciative of your continued support of the Greensboro College community. Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Patty Keller, class of 1998, from the University of Cincinnati, to discuss what you need to know to be a collegiate student athlete. I will now turn it over to Professor Jean Loiko to further introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Peluso. Um, as you'll read on your sheet, I am Professor G. Jean Loiko. I don't know why they keep doing that to me. I go by Jean, but they, they keep wanting to throw that G in there. Um, so, um, and I would love to call her Patty because that's what I used to call her when she was a student of mine. Um, but she told me I could call her Dr. Keller. Um, so, let me talk about Dr. Keller for you then. Uh, Dr. Keller has a bachelor's degree in physical education and sports medicine from Greensboro College. She's got a master's degree in education with a concentration in counseling and administration from Campbell University and a doctorate in education leadership from, from Rowan University. She's a former two-sport athlete here at Greensboro College. She played soccer and lacrosse and uh, she actually began her career as a physical education teacher and an athletic trainer and soccer coach at Greenfleet High School. So from there she began her 16 year career working in college athletics in all phases of student athlete advising, NCAA compliance and administration. Uh, Dr. Keller's worked at every level of the NCAA at Division I's Rutgers and Campbell's University Division III Rowan, Division II University of Maryland, and in addition, she was a junior college athletic director at Camden County um, College. Uh, Dr. Keller's doctorate dissertation research focused on marginalized women in higher education, especially working in college athletics, um, near and dear to my heart. Uh, she's presented at several different professional conferences and written publications for the NCAA and Camden County Woman Magazine. Dr. Keller has taught undergraduate, excuse me, undergraduate classes in athletic and physical education administration, sports management, and graduate classes in NCAA compliance, sports psychology, crisis counseling, assessment in physical education and athletics, human growth and development. She currently is an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. And just a few more interesting facts about Dr. Keller. In 2016, she received the Golden Apple Award for Excellence in Teaching and Student-Faculty Relations. In 2017, she received the Greensboro College Alumni Excellence Award. And she and her husband are licensed foster parents for children who have experienced trauma and have actually adopted their daughter, Dana, who, by the way, just broke her arm this week, so I know she's ready to get home to her daughter. Um, and as I said, I had the wonderful joy of teaching and also experience her greatness on the uh, lacrosse and soccer field, so. Uh, I think we're in for a treat right now. So, Dr. Thank Keller. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. I've given you two sheets. So, you have one is the first one is what is the NCAA? Okay, and we'll go over that one kind of first. I just wanted you to have a visual. 
If you ever go on the Ensway website, there, this actually moves around and does some cool stuff. So if you type in the little on the bottom, it'll do it for you. So it's really neat. So I just want to talk about, as you know, Greensboro College is Division Three, And in Division Three, there are colleges that are state schools. When I worked at Rowan, we had over 10,000 students there. So, and then there's little colleges like Greensboro College who just have maybe 1,000 students, and enrollment is how they drive their budget. On like a big state school like Rowan, that we have a medical school, a huge business school, all kinds of different things, okay? And then you have Division II schools that offer scholarships. They have the partial scholarship model, although there are many student athletes there that are on a full scholarship. So when I worked at Mary, University of Mary in North Dakota, it was a small Catholic school. It probably had maybe about 1,200 students, and we had, you know, our men's and women's basketball team had 10 full scholarships. So, but they would spread that money out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, how we could do that. And then you have Division I that has different levels, okay? So you have big time University of Cincinnati, like I'm at, and, you know, we have all the bells and whistles, but if we look at our budget, University of Cincinnati, it's only $50, 50 million dollars. If you look at Michigan, they're like 1.6 million dollars. It's crazy, the difference, 1.6 billion, crazy, crazy numbers. So there's so much levels in that. So right now, the big conversation in college sports is the admissions process. So we have um, coaches who are you know, violating trust by getting paid by celebrities to get kids in the pen, Yale, Harvard, all those kinds of things. So that's pretty sad that we have that going on. And then we also have the big talk about paying student athletes. Okay, so one of the things I talk to my students about is the NCAA model is made for student athletes that you don't hear about. The ones that you see on TV and they're getting the big endorsements and all that kind of stuff, there's about 100 of them out there at any given year. But there are 16,000 other student athletes that NCAA model is made for. So the NCAA isn't going to change their model all of a sudden because 100 student athletes are amazing and they they want rich endorsement deals and all kind of stuff. Really the NCAA model is made for those student athletes like the two ladies sitting right here who are busting their butt every day competing and all those kinds of things. So that's that's my feeling on it. You'll hear tons of stuff. There's some things I know the NCAA needs to change, but one of the questions I ask my students, do, do the NCAA make the rules? And majority of the time the, the students say, yeah, they make all the rules and they don't make the rules. The schools make the rules. And who's in charge of the schools? The presidents, the presidents are the ones that actually vote at the NCAA convention. That is usually shocking to the general public when I tell them that. They don't know that. They don't know the governance model of the NCAA. So it's very interesting when you get down to the nuts and bolts and when how people know the backstory, the root causes of things, how their opinions change about college sports. But for most of us, we just glaze a headline and look at, oh, we see this on the news, and we really don't know the inner workings of how college sports work. So what I want to talk about is how you become a student athlete. So how do you become a student athlete, ladies? You get recruited, but what did you do all those years before that? <laughs> well, what about school? You succeeded in school, you had a high GPA, you did everything you could. Yep. So in Division Three, all you have to do to be a student athlete is to get admitted to the college, right? Yeah. Division One and Division Two, though, you actually have to have academic requirements. So we're going to talk about that. That's how you become a student athlete. Okay. So one of the things I did want to show you, you can see on the sheet what is the NCAA, and it talks about all the different people that work there. You know, here Brian is wearing a couple hats. You're coaching, you're the AD. Most schools, it's, it's the AD, okay? You go to, and then they might have an assistant AD. You go to Division Two, you have an AD, you have a person, they're only allowed, assistant AD for compliance. They're only allowed to do compliance. They're not really supposed to have other job responsibilities. Is that how reality works? No. When I was the assistant AD for compliance, I was also the SWA, I did all game management, and I did half the fundraising. So people wear many hats in athletic departments, when, the smaller they are. When you go up time, you know, big time division one, we have people that all the one lady does is handle the major donors. Okay, and then we, still, we have a whole office that does tickets. We have, a whole, we have the compliance with five lawyers who work in there too with a bunch of other staff members. And we have a whole media, it's not even sports information anymore, it's media. So you get, when you get up bigger, there's departments, okay? And then coaching staffs are huge. You have a head football coach, and you have eight assistants, and then you have the director of football operations and the director of recruiting, and they both have an assistant, and there's a secretary and all that kinds of stuff. So it really gets intricate in there, okay? So flip it over. This is something I always like. I like showing this one the high, to middle school parents, actually. The estimate, probability competing in college athletics. 
okay? You think about, ladies, all that money your parents put into you going to tournaments, paying for travel coaches, paying for all those extra things. If a lot of the parents put that money away, they almost have a full ride to their kid to go to college. In reality, I have my students at UC do the math all the time. We, well, how much does it cost to go to tournament? Counting the hotels, the meals, the gas to get there, paying your club coach, paying the tournament fees, all that kind of stuff. It usually comes up to fifty thousand dollars over a course of like a kid's six-year period of playing club sports. So then they want them to go play pro. Well, look at the pro, look at the chart there of uh, even trying to get there. So you're more likely your kid's going to be a neurosurgeon than go play pro basketball. Okay. So this is, these are always good, fun, factual information to give people. So now we're going to jump in. So what is the NCAA? Okay. So we kind of talked about it. It's a national office in Indianapolis. They actually have a museum there. You can do tours. I go there a lot. I work with them. They contract me out. So they have people like me across the country who they do, con they do contract work with. So um, my other colleague I work with, she works every Final Four event. They contract her out. They instantly can't handle it all, so they contract out different people sometimes. Okay, But most of the people that do work at the NCAA, 86% of them are attorneys. So, but they have an office of diversity and inclusion. They do all different kinds of things for student athlete development. They've really gotten into the sports sciences end. Concussion really changed some of the things that they were doing. So they, our NCAA student athletes, had, we had better protocols than youth sports. Where we really do at this point. So, okay. So some fast facts: 1,123 college and universities, 98 voting athletic conferences. We're in the USA South here. You guys are in the USA South. 39 affiliated organizations, almost half a million student athletes, 19,500 teams, 90 championships, 24 sports, and three divisions, like we went over. Okay. So. One of the things that student athletes have to do in order to become eligible for NCAA Division I and Division II is register at the Eligibility Center. Did you ladies register at the Eligibility Center at all? I remember doing a lot of online stuff. Online stuff. So students who aren't sure what they can do, they can create a profile page. They actually don't have to pay the money. And any student who's on free reduced lunch do not have to pay the money at all. All their guidance counselor has to do is go into the system, and they can waive them. So most people don't even know that. Okay, so they focus on making sure that our student athletes are coming in academically ready for college. Okay, so customer service is their big thing. I called them constantly when I was working in Division II. We had a lot of students who were international, so they do all that, and there's a lot of different questions with that, so I didn't know the answer, so I just picked up the phone and called. And they would walk you through so many different things. Okay, so this is what it looks like, and we talk about the high school timeline. So in grade nine, do you know in ninth grade what you're planning on doing? No. So this doesn't, in, in our reality, this doesn't really happen, OK? They don't, ninth grade students don't register for the eligibility center. They can, but none, none of them do. Usually they're registering because they want to go on the visit tomorrow and they need to be in there. But this is how it starts, OK? So school counselors who are supposed to know all this stuff, which they don't do, I'm, I'm, and so he contracts me out and I go and talk to school counselors. So, they're the ones who are supposed to be guiding student athletes through the core process, okay? If you are on track to graduate most of the time at your high school, you're on track. So we'll go through what some of those things are. So in 10, they want you to you know, register, make an account. That's not even on anyone's radar yet, most 10th graders, okay? So 11th grade, oops. This is when you should make your account. You should be taking your ACT, your SAT, you can send your, your score right to the eligibility center just like you would send it to a college. I had students calling me as the compliance officer at a Division II school going, hey, did you get my SAT score yet? I had it before they did in our system, in the eligibility system. They usually knew five days before what they would get to them. So it was sent even faster, okay? So unlike colleges, does, I don't know, does Greensboro College allow you to stack your SAT score? Yeah. Okay, so the NCAA does too, which is really cool. Okay, so they let you stack. Most colleges do not let you do that. So students will take their SAT or their ACT over again to get the required score that they might need. Okay? So in grade 10, this is when you're sending in your transcript, okay, to them. They look and read every transcript, okay? 
So when you graduate, your guidance counselor has to actually upload your transcript that says that they graduated up until the eligibility center. Okay? So on the back end, on the college's side, you have a compliance officer like I used to do, and I'm going in the system, did they graduate? Do they have their core classes? Do they meet the minimum GPA? Do they meet the minimum ACT or SAT score? Okay? All those things can make them a couple different levels. Okay? So the registration page looks like this. It's pretty interactive. They have a lot of cool videos on there for, made by student athletes that talk about some of their student athlete experiences so students can listen to them. Okay, so like I said, there's two accounts. You have a certification account, and then there's just a profile page. So a lot of Division III students do this. A lot of student athletes who aren't quite sure what division they want to go to yet, they just make all that, and they can transition as, just as a click as a button to that other certification account, and they can pay the money. So they can have everything in there ready to go, but if they say, say oh, I'm going to go to Greensboro College, they don't have to do it. Okay, but they decide to go to UNCG, they'll have to do it. Okay. So all, these, all that stuff's in there, and then now we have standards. So if you look on that other sheet I gave you, we have a high school timeline, and then on the back there's standards, okay? So Division II and Division I, are, they have a little bit of slight difference, okay? So first thing we're gonna talk about what a core course class is. So what classes do you think you took in high school? What are the normal classes? Science. Math, science, did you take PE? Yeah, but the P doesn't count. <laughs> so everyone's like, I got an A and PE. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't help your GPA, sorry. Okay, but what's foreign languages count? Okay, so American Sign Language is a new class that we're seeing a lot on student transcripts, but they're, the NCAA consider that as a foreign language. Okay, so I have a husband that is severely dyslexic, and he struggled in school, and one of the things that it took, he took to help himself was for, he took American Sign Language, because he had a really hard time doing Spanish. But he took American Sign Language and got an A, so that helped him. He played football at Oregon, okay? So they look at all those things, okay? They look at how, who teaches the course. They ask the school all these kinds of things. How is it taught? Is it taught online? Is it taught in person? The textbook, all those kinds of things, okay? So classes are really, like, you just can't go but fly by the night with some of these classes. They're really examining what they're doing, okay? So non-traditional courses, okay? What do you think a non-traditional course is? Dr. Lasse, what did you teach? Let's see, how about sociology? Sociology. So depending on the course, and they will look up the course description and what's taught in there, they may or may not count sociology as a course. So that always depended. So we would have students who are like, yeah, I'm taking so sociology. Cool. Should be a core class, right? So we had to be careful because sometimes I would, so what I could do as a compliance officer, I could go into that high school had all their core courses listed, and I could tell the student athlete their junior year, because when they came on their visit, I said, bring your transcript. I'm like, hey, I know you have sociology, but that's not counted as a core course. So you're going to have to take another one your senior year. So, but a lot of times people miss that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, so, but that's where students get caught up many times is some of their core courses they think they're taking are great academic courses, but, but, but the way the NCAA has rated it, it's not rated as a core course, okay? So, so this is what, you know, I really talked with our coaches on the back end, like, give me the transcripts. I don't care if it's unofficial on the phone, they're handing it to you as a screenshot, like, let me see it so we can make sure they're on track their junior year, okay? We also want to see their GPA and their test scores if we have them. You spend a lot of money recruiting student athletes, a lot of time recruiting student athletes. If you know their junior year that they're not even close, why would we invest all that time into them? Okay. Yep, we'll go over that. Can you define what amateur means now? I got I will. Next couple slides down. All right. We'll get into that. So so Division I has different academic eligibility requirements than Division II, okay? This is where some Division II schools get really lucky and they get kids who weren't academically eligible Division I, but they were Division II. So, and this is where you see some ter terrific basketball players come out of Division II. They probably should have went Division I, but they weren't there academically. So you think about a big school like UC with 30,000 students, 
Do you really think they're gonna get that personal touch like that a school like you, Greensboro College is gonna give them? So sometimes they are better off being at that Division II for the long run. They usually wind up and graduate because they have people like you who are looking out for them every day, see them every day. Where at our school, I have 137 students in my sport ethics class. I don't even know their names. I try, but it's hard. So that's what we try to tell student athletes too. You have to look at the school that you're gonna be successful in, not just on the court or in the field, but also in the classroom, okay? So Division I, you have to obviously graduate high school on time, okay? Complete 16 core approved core courses, okay? Earn a minimum GPA of a 2.3, and then earn a combined SAT or AT sum score that matches your core course GPA and the sliding Division I scale. If you're 17, do you understand what that means? No, most 17 year olds don't. So do you see how it's confusing for most student athletes and many families? Because our student athletes, majority are coming from some pretty marginalized situations, okay? So there's a whole core, there's a whole chart, but looking at the chart, I'm like, you're looking at it sideways, right? So this is where the school counselor needs to become the best friend with that student athlete and their family and really walk them through what they need to do, okay? So they're telling them to do all this stuff on the timeline, but most of the time, students have to register at the eligibility center to go on an official visit. So their official visit's on Saturday, they're getting on their plane Friday, they're registering on Tuesday. That's usually when it happens. So I get a lot of triggers that for basketball is October 15th, they could go on a visit. So it was pretty interesting what was happening October 1st. I was having all these things come in. So, okay. So what our core course is, you get to four years of English, Okay, you get there three years of math, two years of physical science, including the lab, Dr. Bond, right? You gotta have that lab, you gotta dissect those cats, okay? So then you have an additional English, math, and natural physical science, so they can give you an option, they're not telling you, but they have to choose one of those. Then you have to have two years of social science, so sometimes sociology is counted, sometimes it's not, usually it's U.S. History one or U.S. History two, okay? And then you have to have additional courses, Okay, any areas listed to the left, foreign language, or comparative religion or philosophy. This is where we get kids tripped up too, because if they're usually at a Christian or a faith-based school, usually Bible 101 isn't gonna count, okay? But to them, they think it's a traditional course. They're at a Catholic school, it's traditional, it's hard. You get, oh, that class was so hard, okay? But usually that doesn't count, okay? So they have to do all that. They have to complete 10 of those core courses before your 11th semester. So what would your 11th semester be? End of junior year. End of junior year. So you can't take a whole bunch of courses your senior year, okay? Okay, so they have to be met in time, okay? So seven of those 10 courses must be the English, math, or science, okay? So there, here's that sliding scale, okay? So if you have a GPA of a 2.4, Right? They have on the SAT, they have to have a 920, okay? On the old SAT, they used to have an 840, and then on the ACT sum, because they're adding those scores, they get a 70, okay? So the higher the GPA, the lower the combined score they need? The, the lower the GPA, the higher, the yep. Okay. But in the other way, the higher the GPA, then the lower the SAT, mm -hmm. So you find a lot of kids in high school that really are kind of lazy, right? But they're kind of actually smart, some of them. So that's when you get them down here with their low GPA, they can pass the test with flying colors. And they've changed this so they're missing some kids. There's a group of kids who are usually right here in this 2.75 to the 3.2 range that were actually becoming non-qualifiers because of this, and they had to adjust the, the sliding scale. Okay, so if you are 3.5, all you need is a 400 on your SAT. What kind of high school is giving out a 3.5 or a 400? That, that's required. Right? That's, that's, why that's why there's problems, right? And that's why they have the requirements now with the SAT. Because if there's, there are kids who are getting 3.5, because I little, I've literally had students, and I'm sure you've had students, who have failed my class entirely and come up to the last semester and have tried to pay me. They have tried to say, I'll wash your car, I'll, I'll walk your dog, I'll do all kinds of things if you give me a D or give me a C. And this is what they're doing at the high school level. Or they're staying after school and cleaning the classroom so the teacher gives them a C on the test instead of the F. It happens all the time. We pass kids through, okay? Do we know if that happens more with student athletes than it does not? Oh yeah, there's a lot of pressure. 
on teachers. I was pressured to pass a student this past fall who's from India, but he was a student athlete and he failed my course and he hardly ever came. And I had a lot of pressure to give this kid a withdrawal, not the F. This was the day after the exam. I was like, nope, not doing it. <laughs> so, Dr. Archbong, welcome. <laughs> okay. So then, so we have different classifications. So an early academic qualifier. We have high school football players graduating early in December and going to play spring football at their college or university. We currently have eight new student athletes at UC who are in my sport ethics class who are technically, age-wise, seniors in high school, okay? So they're at UC, they graduated early, they're an early academic qualifier. The one kid's an honor student, he's terrific, he's super smart, but that they're coming in early to learn the place and get into that weight room, okay? So then you have a qualifier that's normal graduation. You, you know, you hang out your senior year, do everything you're supposed to do. You've, everything academically is great, okay? And then they call you a red, and then there's a red shirt. So that's considered a partial qualifier. You missed something. You didn't quite get the GPA, or you have the GPA, you don't quite have the test score, or you have, you have the 15 core classes, but you have the GPA and the test score. They let you come, and they give you your scholarship, but you're not allowed to compete that first year. Okay? And then there's a non-qualifier. They are missing everything, okay? And they can't get their scholarship, and they can't play, and they can't practice. So usually that kid, are they gonna go to that four-year school? Some kids come, we're like, why are you here? Usually you try to funnel those kids to junior colleges, because academically, they're not ready to be there. I don't know why the school let them in half the time. So you really try to get those kids to junior colleges. And believe me, every football coach has a junior college that they work with, okay? We, my husband's best friend is the head football coach at Modesto Junior College out in California, okay? That school in California is bigger than UNCG. It's crazy, okay? But they, we, people call us. We funnel kids to J Jim Stevens, and they have to go. When you leave there in order to play Division I, you have to get your AA. In Division II, they don't have to get their AA. They have to kind of meet another academic certification. So junior college actually get a lot of kids from junior colleges because they don't have to get their AA. So. And there's nothing wrong with a junior college AD. There's nothing wrong with going to junior college. And they can give those kids scholarships and let them play. So then you have a Division I early academic qualifier. Okay, like I talked about, they got all their stuff. They graduated early, okay? The Division I qualifier, they meet all the standards. The red shirt, they're missing something, okay? So they, can, they can't compete, but they can get scholarship and they can, and they can practice. Most times, especially men's sports, they're gonna red shirt your freshman anytime, usually anyway. So that's what I tell students, because then they have a nervous breakdown that they're a partial qualifier. I was like, coach was gonna red shirt you anyway, it's not a big deal. And I say, you know what? This is an opportunity for you to get your master's for free. Because you finish school in four years and then your fifth year is paid for because you're playing, you can get a free master's. Okay. Are there still scholarships while they're being registered? Yep. Yep. So I have four football players and two basketball players in our master's program getting their master's in sport administration at UC right now. So, so Division Two, okay? It's pretty much the same, the 16 core courses, but their earned minimum GPA is a 2.2, where Division One's 2.3. Okay? There's a big difference in that 2.2 and 2.3 that really shuts some kids out of Division I. Okay? When we were at Division II, well, we're like, we'll take them. Okay? But in Division I, if you go into our academic advising staff at University of Cincinnati, I, we have 15 academic advisors for the student athletes. When you came to my school at Division II, it was a one-woman show. Okay? So I really relied heavily as an academic department administrator on our, just our advising staff to help me keep those kids eligible. Okay, because usually those kids are coming in, they're pretty marginalized most of the time, and we're just trying to keep them eligible sometimes. Okay? So, um, Dr. Archibald's son was the uh, captain of the Yale basketball team. In the Ivy Leagues, there are no scholarships. Do they still have to abide by the same rules? Yes. There's no, ac there's no athletic scholarships. Did your son get academic aid? No? Really? Come on. <laughs> the Ivies have so much money, every one of those kids is on a scholarship. Okay, so when my husband worked at Penn, 
most of those, a lot of those kids are coming from blue bloods or blue collared family. The kids that are coming from a blue collar family, they were paying less money than to go to Penn than they were to go to Rowan. So they really, if you don't have a lot of money, but you can go there and you've earned it and you're academically solid, they'll make sure you, you don't pay. They'll take care of you. So that's the how they got a lot of, excuse me? At the Ivies. At the Ivies. Yeah, so the Will Duke's like a, a mile of Ivy, right? So Colgate's one of them too. So they would take, yeah. So that's what my cousin wants to go to Princeton and she's super smart. My aunt, uncle, one's a cop, one's a teacher. And I'm like, no, like you guys probably will never pay a dime for her to go there because of what you do for a living because she's so smart. So don't discourage her from going there. So my husband got a lot of kids recruit when he coached football there. A lot of blue collar kids out the farms of North Dakota, South Dakota, Oregon, who were just really smart and hardworking kids. We got full rides to Penn. For, they played football for them, but they were now brain surgeons. So, yeah. Okay. And I've learned working with coaches. I don't know if Coach Leiko will tell you this. The young coaches will take on the projects. They really will. And I go, you'll spend 90% of your time with that kid. And as they get older, they take on less projects because they'd rather have the kid that has the 4.0 who they can coach and work with than the kid has the 2.2 who may or may not stay here. So, so then the Division II core courses, okay, it's pretty much the same thing. But for English, they only need three years. Okay, so Division II has a lot of international student athletes because of this reason. Okay. Same thing, they have a sliding scale, but it's a little more adjusted, okay? So here, the 2.75, they only, on the new SAT, they only need a 590, okay? So you have a little more give and take. Most, a typical Division II profile is pretty much like a Greensboro College, maybe a little bit bigger, okay? So smaller class sizes, okay? You can track them more, easier, things like that, okay? So like I said, they have the same thing, early academic qualifier, now they do it now. They hardly do it in Division II, but they can, okay? A qualifier, a partial qualifier like we talked about, and then a non-qualifier, okay? It's the same thing, sliding scale. They don't redshirt in Division II. Oh, yes, yeah, some of them do, depending on the kid. Um, a lot of times the quarterbacks will be redshirted, so. So, and then they can do the partial qualifier where they'll come in and they're not quite there academically and they practice but they don't ever compete and they get their aid. So, so let's talk about, this is one of the misnomers and I didn't know this until I went to Division II. Most people think, well yeah, they're on a partial scholarship. Men's women's basketball each get 10 full scholarships, right? So you have how many people on a basketball team? 18, right? So say for any student who comes to your school who has a 3.2 GPA or above, you give them $8,000 in academic aid, right? So say your school for easiest is 20 grand a year. Well, I have six kids that have a 3.2 GPA, so I'm all gonna give them that $8,000 academic aid. And then I'm gonna take 12,000 out of my budget of scholarships and couple that, and then they're on a full ride. But I didn't use all my money, right? Because I have 10 full scholarships times 20, so I have more money to play with in there. So yeah, then I have that kid that has a 2.5. I'm gonna give him all of my athletic money, okay? But I have that budget in there to do that. That's how Division II is pretty successful, and usually kids who are Division II are actually usually walking out paying less money than a lot of Division I Olympic sports, so. And then you have our Division III athletes, like I told the girls, I still have a $900 payment every month. So I could be driving a Range Rover instead of a 10-year-old Honda Pilot, but I wouldn't change the thing, I'd still come here again. All right, so then Division Three, you guys know, they determine their own eligibility, right? For admissions, financial aid, practice, and competition, okay? So right before I was coming through, and I think they were still doing it, we got leadership scholarships sometimes, okay? I don't know if it's necessary because I was a leader because I was a pretty good goalkeeper, right? But <laughs> they did things like that, but they really cracked out on that, right? So the NCAA doesn't do eligibility, anything for Division Three athletes. Okay. So participation, Dr. Leslie asked about amateurism, right? So amateurism, you decide to run in a road race and you win and you get a $100 cash prize. Do you lose your amateurism status as a college student athlete? 
Yes. But it's pre pretty quick to get that reinstated. It doesn't take a whole lot. So, but if you don't report it and three years down the road they learn that you did it, they're probably not going to like say you can never run again, but they're going to hold you out like three cross country meets and you have to pay $100 a charity. That's the things that they'll do. Okay? So there's outside activity reports that student athletes are supposed to fill out while they're college student athletes. So I had tons of cross country runners that run in 5Ks all the time. And I'm like, that's great. You can win. Don't try to lose, but you can't keep the money. So, and we've had student athletes come home and there's a $500 check in the mail to them because they didn't pick it up on race day. Then they send them the check. I'm like, bring me the check. So we would literally mail that check to the NCAA with a letter and they were totally fine. And usually the NCAA is like, we can mail it back to the race or we can have you donate it to a charity. Just have to document it. So usually the student athletes will donate it to a charity. Okay. So, but then you have contracts with professional teams. Okay. This is where with the international student athletes, it's we need to tag them early when you're working in Division One and Division Two because overseas, some of those kids who are 16 years old are playing on a professional team. If they're just getting paid to travel, their uniform and meal money, then that's okay. They're still getting paid, right? But if they're getting paid a lot of money, then that's where the NCAA does tons of research on those teams. Okay. And then you get salary for participating in athletics. My husband will tell you he used to after every game shake the booster's hand, you get a $500 handshake, right? Well, now our student athletes are getting $10,000 in cars dropped off at their houses, okay? So, the, so is it the NCAA's job, NCAA's job to track all those things? Do you think they have the manpower to do all that? No, they're not, and they're not. They're not actually actively tracking. As a compliance officer, I had to ask questions of student athletes that I would tell them and go, I'm really sorry that I have to ask you these questions. And some of them were pretty invasive, but I need you to answer them. Okay? So even if we had a student athlete's parent die, we could fly them home. We could pay for their ticket. I had to show the obituary to the NCAA and the flights and all that kind of stuff. You're allowed to do that. You just have to show proof of why you did it. So there's tons of things that go along with it. So then you have prize money above the actual and necessary expenses, okay? Playing with professionals can hurt your amateurism. So there are things they're going to ask you. So when you go through the eligibility center, they ask you all these questions, things that you've done. Tryouts, practice, or competition with a professional team. Benefits from an agent or prospective agent, okay? So schools like you see, we use our law school quite a bit. We have an advisory committee through our law school who sit and talk to our prospective student athletes that are going to get drafted by the NBA or the Major League Baseball or the NFL, and they talk with them about their options. They're not their agent, but they advise them, and a lot of schools do that. But then you have, a, say, you have a kid here who's just a phenom, Ryan Nelson. You know, he played for Major League Soccer. What do you do with a kid like that, right? That they don't have a resource at a school to do. Dr. Archbong might be able to help them a little bit. Okay, but they, they don't have those people to help them. So a lot of times the agent's already in their ear. So those are the things that we really try to talk with student athletes about ahead of time. And we have in Division One, Division Two, they have education sessions just on this alone. So, and then agreement to be represented by an agent. Okay, even if it's an informal agreement, it still counts. So you got to be careful of that. And then delayed f initial full-time collegiate enrollment to participate in organized sports competition. Okay? If you're like my little brother, I shouldn't call him my little brother. He is this tall. Okay? But he didn't become this tall until he was 18 years old. So he's the kid that, late bloomer, right? The kid that you put into a Blair Academy, which is where I grew up, is a fifth year, they have fifth-year programs, right? Hopefully he'll bloom, and then he can be six foot six and play college ball. Okay? Or maybe you didn't have the grades enough. You're allowed w one year. But after that, but then you, you have some things. So you think about the Mormons, they go on a two-year pilgrimage, right? So there are exceptions to that rule, the Mormons especially. My husband coached at Utah for a long time. And he's like, yeah, I had Mormons who had 24 years old with three kids that I was coaching. So, but it was nice. He goes, and they were nice and big by then. So <laughs> he goes, we like the Mormon kids, OK? But they didn't get in trouble, he said, because they had four kids at home. They were too tired to get in trouble. <laughs> all right? So all this stuff, the sports participation, it's, everything's in there. So when you register, they actually make you, the students watch a video. But you guys know watching video. Do you really know? Does someone really hold your cheeks like this and really drill it into you? No. Okay? So that's, 
The NCAA does the best they can, and that's why they contract with people like me. So I went to the Ohio Athletic or the Ohio Guidance Counselors Conference. I'm going to the Kentucky one, and I presented to all the school counselors because it's nice to hear from me because the people in the NCAA office, you know, they're attorneys and they work in the office. They're not working daily on the ground with all the issues that the student athletes are facing or encountering. And I'm on the phone with the school counselor most of the time, trying to get a transcript for things. So it's nice to have people like me who can go and present and answer some of those questions because I've dealt with it. Okay. So uh, over 94% of students don't require additional amateurism questions from the NCAA. So only 6% do after the follow-up, after they do their initial, okay? So like I talked about, the NCAA makes the rules for those 94%. That's why they're there. The other 6% that is in the media and the limelight, everyone needs to change the rules because of those 6%. But do you change the rules for 6%? So that's Maybe the question. Well, they could be, or they could be kids like Zion Williamson from Duke right now, right? So you have those kids. There are those kids out there, right? And that's where the rules are really hindering them, but the rules aren't made for them. They're made for the other 94%. So, And honestly, there's a lot of things you can actually put in for to the NCAA, and they will give you a waiver for it. People don't realize that. There's a football player, if you watch the movie Student Athlete by LeBron James, and I have my students do this, and I said they had to find five myths in there and five facts in there. So they found a lot of myths. They didn't find a whole lot of facts in this documentary by LeBron James, which is scary to me because LeBron James has never played college athletics, right? And he's producing this documentary. So one of the students there played a Baylor who walked on. They're saying he was homeless, right? All these things. Well, I know people at Baylor. They actually didn't put a waiver in for him because he raped a girl. But they never say this in the documentary. Right? So now you have all these people thinking the NCAA has done this kid wrong. In the reality, he has a student conduct code written up for raping a girl. So they actually, they just told him to move on. They didn't kick him out of school. And they didn't definitely didn't get him a waiver. And the NCAA has stated and said, Baylor has never filed a, a waiver request for this student. So, but then you, you don't get the backstory and the root cause of things. So if you ever come to my classes and make you dig and do a little research, we don't just read the headlines. Okay, so there are reminders and the student athletes, once they, once they register, they have it on a timeline. So they start sending them mes text messages saying, okay, you're, we know by the timeline you're a junior. You need to do, send your transcript in. We know by the timeline you should be December of your senior year. You need to do this, okay? Right? And they have tons of resources on there for school counselors, for parents, for college athletic administrators. They have posters, all kinds of stuff, okay? And then the amateurism, you can follow them on Twitter, Snapchat, all that kind of great stuff. Instagram, I don't even do Instagram, okay? And they have a guide for the college-bound student athletes, it's about this thick, so. And they have quick in initial eligibility reference sheets, so, and then that's all the stuff. So I do want to briefly talk about the NAI. I know that it's, that's an option out there that people don't, aren't even aware of. It's very similar to Division II. So um, there's 250 schools. They have 60 million in athletic scholarships, or 600 million, I'm sorry. They have 21 conferences, 26 championships, and 65,000 student athletes. So it's very, very similar to Division II. Most of the schools are faith-based in their level of play, and they're usually small, usually about 1,000 to 2,000 students at their schools. So, so then you can see the NAI versus Division II. Average full-time enrollment is 1,700, so Division II is 4,000. Um, private schools are 81%, where Division II is 51. They're only required to sponsor six sports, where Division II is required to sponsor 10. The average budget in NAI is 2.9 million. For a Division II, it's 5.4. Athletic budget or college budget? Their, their athletic budget. Because you're counting scholarships in there. Don't forget your scholarships. Okay, I know, you're just like, that would be nice, right? And then their cost, this is, so they're paying, per student athlete, $12,800, or Division II is paying $17,000, okay? And then you have increased student athlete participation. Their growth period is 21%. The, NI the NII was going downhill for a while, but it is going up. Thomas More, which was Division III, uh, they're like a Division III powerhouse, is right over the bridge in Kentucky from us. They are going to NAI, because he's tired, his <laughs> A, yeah, Terry's done. So they had a, a violation there that really pissed off the AD and the president. And they tried to work with the NCAA on it and didn't go well. And they are now switching to NAI. It's cheaper to belong. 
They want to do some things with eSports, which the NAI has jumped on like this, where the NCAA isn't even glancing at it. The NAI has jumped on cheerleading, and the NCAA won't even talk about it. So there's really some great things going on with the NAI. And I mean by jumping on cheerleading? The NAI has a national cheerleading championship and is oh, recognized as a varsity exactly. sport. Okay. So Positive. yeah, it's a great thing. They've jumped all over it saying there's all these girls running around cheering who are throwing themselves in the air and doing all kinds of crazy. My roommate in college was a cheerleader. She always hurt. Uh, Amy Beth, <laughs> always hurt. So, but they're seeing that all these girls are cheering and it's not silent cheer anymore. It's a good mix between tumbling gymnastics. I mean, there's some cheer in there. So. And that's, there's a, a lawsuit, the Quinnipiac case that came down probably about 14 years ago. And one of the things was there's no national championship in cheerleading, so you can't count cheerleading as a college sport. Well, the NCAA instituted it last year. So that, I'm waiting for that court case to be challenged. So, and then this, their postseason post rate, so 17% of their student athletes get to participate in postseason. So our coaches in the room know that one of the things when you recruit is you want to tell your student athletes that you get to go on the postseason play. So, okay, and they have a whole and they have their own eligibility center too. So it's totally separate. Okay, so I showed you all the comparisons. Here they are in a chart. So you can kind of see there what you need for Division One. They have the sliding scale, but 2.3 right away, 2.2 Division Two NAI is 2.0. Okay. So it's a little bit easier to get into there. How does this top 50% class rank? They also do a class rank system, so top 50%. So say you only go to a school that has 10 kids and you're four, are you top 50%? <laughs> no, but some schools only have, I only had 90 in my graduating class. When my daughter will go to high school, she'll have 470 in her graduating class. So they look at class rank, but I, don't, I would not take that in, knowing the sizes of the different schools and things. So. All right, now you get to ask me questions. <laughs> the, um, the high school student, the young lady that is going to Rutgers, I believe. Mm -hmm. She's from Louisiana. Yep, and the high, their high school athletic association ruled her ineligible. Yeah, what was that all about again? She, if I remember right, she took money from a friend parents to go to some kind of tournament or something that she didn't do on purpose. It was in, actually, I think she won prize money, if I remember right. And they repaid it back. The NCAA even was like, she's good to go with us. But the Louisiana, the Louisiana High School Athletic Association would not deem her eligible. So, because I think, you know, the NCAA even went and talked to them, like, we're okay with this. Why aren't you okay with this? There's the same situation going on, on, Ohio, on in Ohio with a football player that they've gone to court now about deeming him ineligible and it was something to do with his eligibility and his amateurism, but they, they won't budge on it. Unfortunately, pressured, pressured him enough that yep. did let him play. Unfortunately, in high school athletic associations, it's usually one or two people making a decision. In the NCAA, it's a, it's a group of people, it's a committee who are made up of the membership. It's not, it's usually, a, there's an NCAA staff member who's the liaison, but it might be an SWA from Greensboro College if you're at the Division Three level, an athletic director, a college president, an FAR. They're the people on a committee making a decision on a lot of these waivers. So for the high school athletic association, it's usually the director of the high school athletic association and maybe the other guy in the office making that decision. There's no committee. So that's what's kind of scary with some of those things, so. So in high school, I did, I did program with Josh and Beth Taylor. So like with the eligibility center, like say for instance, certain schools like don't really take into consideration your IB credit. Mm -hmm. like maybe they'll do as a weighted grade or something like that. Would the eligibility center do that separately Compared to like the college? They redo your GPA. Okay. So they don't take the weighted credits. Yeah, because nothing down here takes IB. No. Because <laughs> Grimsley's IB, International Baccalaureate. Yeah. They were anyway. Level with this, I would just love to hear your take on paying student athletes versus not paying student athletes. I'll put it this way. My husband played Division One college football and does not have a school loan. I pay $900 every month. We are now 45 and 50 years old. I am still paying every day for my student loan. He doesn't pay anything. You don't think he got paid? Right? That's kind of what I thought you were going to Yeah, <laughs> okay. There are 6% of kids 
that do bring a lot of money to school, and I think they should be earning some things for their signature, their likeness, and things like that, but they're six, that's 6% 6 of those 19,000 student athletes. Some things do need to change. I don't think, you need to start paying all the student athletes, right? There's student athletes playing women's soccer and men's soccer who aren't getting any money at all, right? So how can you, how, or how does the NCAA defend that like they can't make They don't have to worry about guys. defending it. They don't make the rules. The NCAA does not make the rules. It would have to come from all the athletic departments in the country coming together to change a rule, okay? So perfect example, in, in Ohio, the Ohio high schools used to play a bunch of football games in Nippert, which is the big college arena at UC, okay? The Ohio football, high school football coaches association brought a rule change up and said, we would like our, our high school kids not to be recruited until October 30th. October 15th. We want them to enjoy the first four or three games of the season without having recruiters here, okay? Which is great, right? You want them to enjoy that first big game of their season, not feel all that pressure being watched. I mean, it's kind of hard when Urban Meyer is standing at your game, okay? So the Ohio Football Coaches Association brought this up, okay? So they brought it to the College Football Coaches Association. The College Football Coaches Association brought it back to the colleges, two conferences. It takes two conferences to sponsor a change in the rules. They sponsored a rule change. They do education on it for like a year, and they vote on it at the national conference in January. And it voted, and it passed. So they implemented it. They created a dead period. Well, during, it's a dead period. If you're, it's a dead period, student athletes aren't allowed on campus. So now the first three weeks of football season is a dead period. Well, they can't come on campus and play their football game anymore. All the public talked about was the damn NCAA. Who created? Who initiated that rule? The High School Football Coaches Association. So you can, you'll start seeing where they're talking about that now. Should we be giving the kid from Clemson, the quarterback with you know, the long, blonde, flowing hair? My daughter calls him Sunshine, if you ever watch Remember the Titans. So my daughter watches all these movies with us. But you know, should he be getting his name, image, and likeness paid for? Probably not right now, but probably set up an uh, account for him later down the road, yes. I agree with that, yes. But for the five women soccer players and three baseball players who are sitting in my classes who aren't on a full ride, maybe they need a full scholarship too. They're putting in the same amount of work as that student athlete is. So there's a lot of different things that go into it besides just we have to pay them. So, because when they come to campus, they, if you're on a full ride, you get your dorm for free and they usually live in a nice, pretty nice dorm. You get gear, head to tail gear. You get an iPad. You have a nutritionist. You have an act, one academic advisor serves men's basketball. Football has five in Division One, right? You have your own personal life coach with you all the time, okay? All these extra benefits, if you start making them tangible values and going into what their scholarship, above and beyond their scholarship, they are getting paid, okay? And they're leaving that school without a school loan that quadruples in interest year after year after year, okay? So that's how I see it. but. You know, just some lady who thinks something. Ryan. Why do you think, in your opinion, that the NCAA uh, doesn't have academic requirements that are equal across the board? You know, at the Division three level, um, it's, it's kind of unlevel mm -hmm. um, when you're talking academics, because if, if Institution A can let him or her into school and Institution B will not, and there's no governing body, it's, it's a significant yeah, and so, I'm curious. exactly, when I worked at Rowan, we were a state school, there, we had to take these marginalized students because it was part of our state funding. We got kids at Rutgers, Delaware, Penn State were recruiting that they could never go there. And then I got them dropped in my lap, I'm like, they shouldn't be in college, right? right? And then we'd kill our retention rate because they would be gone in a year. But then like at Greensboro College, probably won't take those kids because they're not state funded, right? They don't have the money for those extra little programs and they have an academic standard that they need to hold. But you do have special admits. Every school's got them, right? So you look at hit, you look at Yale, Harvard, Penn. I'm gonna my my husband's boss is getting indicted on April 4th, when he was the basketball coach at Penn. He's now the associate head coach at the Celtics. He's taken over $350,000 in cash while he was the coach at Penn to let to sign Joe Blow's son in, who oh make him a basketball recruit. He wasn't a basketball recruit. So there's coaches, this is going to open wide open just like the FBI scandal with the um, other basketball Adidas. So. I mean, just in, so it's a, 
you know, it's a, it's a 2 2 GPA requirement to get into D1, D2, mm -hmm. D3, and it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's an even 850 SAT across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I know the answer, but I, you know, Division Three is the largest body in the NCAA. Yep. And with the and the highest, and the student athletes usually have the highest GPAs. With the least about amount of say. So mm -hmm. I, I find it curious when you're working at a major institution like you are, it, just at the presidential level, because they mm -hmm. do make the rules. Yep. Like how does the intricacies? How how do people justify what the heck is going on outside of money? Yeah. I mean, I question them all the time. I do. And it's interesting because I can c talk about it from being at the Division three level as a student athlete and working out of school for almost nine years and then going to a big time Division one and seeing the crap they pull and like, we would never ever do this in Division three ever, right. right? So it's amazing to see that. It's really eye-opening working at University of Cincinnati because it's way different than Rutgers. So Rutgers is almost Ivy League. It's University, University of Cincinnati wants to be Rutgers academically. They're really trying to get the, in their AUP ranking up there, but they can't. But I said some of the stuff you're pulling down here doing this stuff isn't going to help you with your AUP ranking. They wanted to get in the Big 12. They really, really tried, and they didn't get in there. It's Chris, some of the stuff that's going on academically. It wasn't from athletics. So and that's what you got to stop letting in those kids. So <laughs> yeah. But that's why they have academic advisors and people literally banging on dorm doors and waking kids up and walking them to class. So, yes, you have a question? Or are you stretching? Me? Oh, no, her, behind you. I do have Oh, one. all right. Did you have a Okay. Ladies first, I'll be No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, 40 years ago when I started as a sports writer to writer, and I've covered all pro, uh, pro leagues and, and kind of a lot of colleges. I was struck by that there were still a lot of people who played for the love of the game. Mm -hmm. What is the point of the modern college athlete today? Why do they go? What is, I mean, it's a big philosophical question. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of them. And I've talked to those that missed, lost their scholarship and they're dealing drugs. And I'm curious, what, what does the NCAA say to people? I see their commercials where yeah. it's really moving and stuff, but I, it, we're living in such a cynical age uh, and my best friend was the, the golf coach and the, uh, the hockey coach at Bowdoin, a real power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're in the NESCAC, yeah. I know. And his conversation, and Sid Watson, who the arena is named for, was also one of my best friends. He was, they're both in the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. of college hockey. Their first, their recruiting trips, they talked about why you want to play hockey and what your life's going to be after that. Mm -hmm. And I would just, I don't get that impression. I'm on a board or two at East Carolina, and I'm amazed at, and at Ruffin McNeil, the former football coach. I think a lot has to do with parents living out their dreams for their children. Awesome. Yeah, I wondered if it really <laughs> starts. Yeah, it's crazy. I sit in the sidelines now. My daughter's nine, and the parents are absolutely nuts. Absolutely. We don't even sit by them. My husband and I do not. They're unrealistic in their expectations, what they're expecting out of nine, 10, 11 year old kids. So, it, I mean, they don't, like, my daughter, before she broke her arm on Saturday, tomorrow night they have ice skating, the roller skating. The school does it twice, twice a year. They open the skating ring for all the kids. Well, she had soccer practice on Tuesday, and I, on Thursday, and I said to the coach, you're going to cancel practice, right? They have their biannual skating thing. Now, mind you, they don't have a game for another month. Oh, why would I do that? They need the practice. I'm like, they're nine. They should go to skating. Like, that's, that's. Like, all you're doing is making my kid my pick from two of her favorite things at nine years old. My daughter was the captain of her field hockey team in Maine, mm -hmm. and she was damn good. And she kept getting calls from people, and she didn't want to go on an athletic scholarship. She mm -hmm. wanted to be a writer, like her stupid old thing. And, and, uh, and yet, I was amazed at the intensity of the coaches at that level. In Maine, we were on vacation at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. uh, it's beautiful August, mid-August afternoon, and she received a phone call that if we, she didn't get back for the start of the, the season practice in Maine, she would not be the captain of the team. So we had to drive nine hours to get there. Well, it's, it's sad. I mean, college coaches uh, in basketball sports, they, they, they U teams and stuff like that have taken over half the high school situation in terms of recruiting mm -hmm. young teams. And if they don't play in that, 
they're not going to get recruited. Yep. And it's uh, it, it's it's shame. Mm -hmm. uh, it's they've taken athletics out of high school, uh, where it's a, had a ha somewhat of an equal playing field to its. Uh, and it still comes down to money. Can you afford to have your kid go play in that? Because if he doesn't play in that, he's not getting recruited. Yep. And it's sad. People have really turned things into money-making things. There's a thing called Captain U. Did you girls register it, right? Well, how much was it? Oh, I, didn't, I just did the free, like the free. You could do the free profile, right? So really, they're not charging the student athletes. They're charging the coaches that go on. There's a huge database of students. So if you're one of those divisions, or you're a Greensboro College who works on enrollment, you're pounding the streets for kids. Right, you have to. It's your job. You have. To. When I worked in, at University of Mary, our women's soccer coach had to have 30 girls on our roster. Had to have 30 girls on our roster. That's too many for a women's soccer team. But that was her number. She was given by our mission staff and by our president. That was your number. 30 girls. Well, six of those girls were never going to play, and they were going to pay full tuition. And that was part of it. They. They recruited for enrollment of the college. Not, they did not recruit for the betterment of the athletic department and their team. And that's where we're at with a lot of colleges, unfortunately, where we have roster sizes that are way too huge. And we don't have the budget to the last five girls that need to have a uniform jersey. We don't have enough, which is sad. And a lot of schools are running like that. Hi. Thank you for your information. Yeah. Very helpful. And um, I'm trying to put together what I want to say here, because I come looking at a student perspective. And I think I heard you say just a little bit ago that no matter what the roller skating or whatever is, the coaches don't want to uh, stop practice. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that is across the board in college communities in all fields, not just in the sport. Mm -hmm. The pressure on the students is extraordinary. Yep. And we are recognizing here we have a lot of stress and anxiety again. This is across the board. In our I college. just put a grant into the NCAA about mental so health wellness that's, program. That's yep. universal that we all ought to get together around and say, what can we do uh, to help our students in yep. that regard? But I want to thank you for your Yeah, opinion. we that mental health is a big thing right now yes. that, you know, and our, our kids are coming in and they have issues that we don't even know about what's going on at home. And my husband and I are foster parents. I deal with trauma all the time. So, but a lot of our kids come in, are coming out of homes that you should see where they're living. Right? And their parents think that my kid isn't that bright, but God, he can shoot that basketball, and he is our ticket to the, to out of this nightmare, right? Yeah, and, and so, and they put that pressure on that kid, and that kid is sending half their scholarship check home, you know, because they get cost of attendance checks home to their parents to pay for rent, pay for groceries, pay for their little brother's Nikes, things like that. Nice. So. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One might put you on the spot. The other one is. Uh, in basketball, college basketball now, one and dones. Okay. Yeah. What is your opinion about one and dones have done to the quality of basketball? Oh, I think it's ruined it. So I think I'm ready for this G League. I think the NBA is getting on board with just letting go from high school again to go. There's just kids that unfortunately they are not, they shouldn't be in college, right? And their whole goal isn't to go to college and get a degree in biology or criminal justice. Their goal is to go be an NBA player, yeah, right? Yeah. That's what they've been trained for, so they can go in the G League or make it to the. Let them. Why are we stopping them? No, I think I think the, the NBA has kind of changed the rules to allow the 18-year-olds to yeah. get to the league. Uh, but now it's 19. That's why you got the one and done. Mm -hmm. And the one and dones have have really led to some dominance of programs. Oh yeah, but then they're gone in a year. That's it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Zion Williamson. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Kentucky's pretty bad, too. The street down, it's my was school down the street. That was, I was curious about that. Second question is the amateur rules. Is the amateur rules the same for all divisions, one, two, and three? Yes. Okay, so in other words, I could go play double, uh, single A ba baseball in the summer and come back and play soccer in the, in the fall. Yeah, because it's for the sport, it isn't for you as a student that, athlete. It's across the board. Mm -hmm. sports. Yeah, it's for the sport. <laughs> Yeah, because we had a um, Division Two. We had a kid that played minor league baseball and came and played football as last year. Because Division Two, they're on a um, you're in a five year clock Division One, but Division Two is ten full time semesters. So he was like 26 years old getting his degree, and he never played college sports before. So he started playing football. But he was he had played. He played pro baseball. Pro baseball. <laughs> played in the in minor leagues. Mm-hmm. It was not 
not a problem. No, because it's per he wouldn't couldn't play baseball at the school, but he could play but football. You could, you could mm -hmm. play a different sport. Yep. You could be professional in one and yep. play a different sport in the Yeah, we had a, I checked with the NCAA. I mean, I called them like four times to make sure I got the right answer. Because sometimes when you call, you get different people to answer the phone. Sometimes, sometimes you do shop for an answer. So, because they record all their calls, and I record who I talk to and take their number down. So that's Division Two. That's in Division One as well. Yeah, you're not going to see. But in Division One, they have a five-year clock, so you're not going to see that. In Division Two, they have ten. It's ten full-time semesters. So. Do you know what that means? Five-year clock is when you graduate high school, and then you have five years from that point. Okay. Division Two is ten full-time semesters. So, say you go to school for a year, you use two semesters, then you take off five years to play pro ball. You still have. Eight eight full-time semesters to compete. So you get a lot of veterans division two for that too. It's pretty amazing because of that 10 year clock, the, the type of student, we, we lined all our kids up. We did a thing one year with ice cream social. I said, all right, I want you to line up by birth year. And then they had to talk to each other by how old we were. We started off with a 17 year old. We already went up to a 29 year old. So, yeah, 10 full-time semesters. Yeah. But when we started football here at GC, we had football players that were old. <laughs> old. They were like in their 30s. We had kids in their late 20s. You know, they, yeah. I mean, if you watch, if you watch, there's two football movies out there. Um, the Replacements. About four of those guys in The Replacements and the coach, of the one, he was coached here, and four of the guys played football here. They're in the movie. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. So there's some trivia about Greensboro College. Sometimes I think we get caught up in all the abuses in, in sports, especially college sports, and <coughs> what um, athletes may be given <coughs> that may potentially put them over um, the line and, and not amateurs anymore. But we had a baseball coach here years ago, Scott Rash, who uh, I was complaining to one day <coughs> during the, the Major League Baseball strike. Yeah, you know, and I said, I'm really upset. There's no baseball. And he said, what do you mean there's no baseball? Go to any field in Greensboro, and you can see baseball all the time. Mm -hmm. And he reminded me that there are people who still place a value on the intrinsic rewards of participating and watching sports as well. You can go to the Greensboro Ice House any night, and mm -hmm. you can see A-level hockey players who pay to be in the league in order to play. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still play indoor soccer. I'm 45 years old. Yeah. Girls, what did I tell you? What did you learn about being a student athlete? And what, how is that value going to help you when you get done? Time management. You know, about like, are you looking for one specific answer? No. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, uh, you talked a lot about how time management, like um, when you go to like get a job in the future, it shows like, um, how much you're able to manage your time because a lot of us are like working jobs and going to classes and getting to practice on time. So for many companies, they are recruiting student athletes and that's who they want to work for them. So they, I tell student athletes all the time, make sure your student athlete is written prominently on your resume. You will get a job over someone else's 4.0 GPA. I just so. want to stand up and say one thing for it because that's a real principle of athletics. And it still is the parents' job to raise their kids. Yep. It's not the coach's job. The, the parents are still the ones that say, okay, you go do this. And they do it because they feel like they have to do it for their kids. Well, when do the parents be in charge of the kids and when do the kids quit being in charge of the parents? And the real principles that athletics teach are the reasons that the ones you're saying, look, at these recruiters will come because they understand the time, they understand work, they understand, and they're the ones that are being successful. And, one of the reasons I'm teaching this class at this university now is to bring in CEOs, doctors, lawyers, orthopedic surgeons who attribute their success to athletics. So again, you know, the NCAA says we're not going to change it for 94. We're 94 percent. I think that's just still the same thing. You know, they put that in the news because the parents were rich enough to do that. They've been breaking that rule forever, but not at the same levels. Mm -hmm. You know, but I know. I coached at Carolina for 30 years. I know basketball players, I know football players, I know other athletes. That it wasn't done in the same level, but it, overall, it was way above the 94%. Mm. And I think when we get back to that and realize that athletics still teaches great principles and that 
we have to be in charge of the kids. They can't be in charge of us. I tell, you ask my daughter any day, I tell her, who's in charge? You are. That's damn straight, right? Because I see kids running around and they're telling their parents what to do and they're nine years old. Even I have kids, my daughter's friends call me Patty. I'm like, ah, oh, it's Mrs. Keller to you, right? But our, my daughter's teacher even said to me, and she's up there, she's 60, she goes, these kids don't have manners anymore. Parents are not teaching their kids manners. And, and we have, and that's what, we have kids who are amazing. And unfortunately, a lot of those kids take a bad rap for those 25% those of those kids who aren't so great, right? Well, I'll say the, the impact on the media, um, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of what our coaches do departmentally, um, you know, and I use this speech all the time, if it wasn't for TVs, nobody would know, like, the difference in levels. Mm -hmm. um, so much great that happens in athletics, but because of media, um, Jim is a sports writer here, w what's going to garner the interest, the good, but also the bad. Yeah, so, I teach a class the good, bad, and ugly in college yeah, athletics. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, and it, we, everything's out there. It's not even, you're not even looking at the news on the front page. No one reads the paper anymore. It's what just came across my, my phone's probably blowing up. I have everything tagged, <laughs> right? So I know now. And it, you know stuff that you don't even know all the details about, and then you're making, basing your decision on a blip it, right? And you're not really, the reporter, there's no reporter anymore sometimes really flushing out all the details and presenting a story a week from now, because they're on the pressure to put it out now. There's no reporter, period. Yeah, so that's one of the things I even, I teach with our students is just find the root cause of how all this happened, right? You see the snippet, go dig deep now what's going on. And it's amazing how when the students' opinion, I work with students, their opinion starts to change based on knowing all the facts of the situation. And that's why I teach it with ethics. I'm like, all right, now you know all the facts. How do you feel in this ethical so solution? Would you have made the same decision that you made the first time? And now we're looking at it three weeks later with all the information, right? They're like, oh, no, I made a totally different decision. So any other questions? What, what is the, if there is any, Rules governing international students playing Division One sports. There's a whole section <laughs> of a book of the NCAA manual. Yes, so they have to go through the amateurism process, and the NCAA spends a lot of time. And they they already know they have all the club sports overseas researched and cataloged and all kinds of stuff. So they because I called them right away. We had quite a few international student athletes at my school in North Dakota, and I would call them right away and say, Hey, I got this girl from Jamaica. Here's look her up for me, and they would look at all all her like amateurism. Her club, they already knew all the club teams and stuff, and they would they could usually tell us, oh, she'll be fine. We know this club team, and so they do all that. Yeah. How do we handle Olympic athletes in sports like track? So right now, the best high jumper in the world, her name is Loretta Brunt, Blunt, and she's at UCA. She's six foot six. She makes me look tiny. I love standing next door. So she's getting extra training on campus and doing things. They have, they have waivers for Olympic athletes. You just have to put the waiver in. It's not hard. I'm looking at, you know, at one time, Paul, I mean, there's probably been as well, Olympics was really for amateur athletes. You know, yeah. Now you can have your professional players, now. Play, baseball players, yeah. hockey players, basketball players. Or Konami. Yeah. But you go to some of these state sponsored, uh, country sponsored teams. Yep. Where technically they're really professional, but they're amateur because they're not necessarily. When they're paying for their necessary expenses. So they're paying for where they live, they're paying for their food, and they're paying for their coaching, but they're not paying them a salary, right? Or they give them like a small stipend, then they have a limit on that. That's what we That's, understand. Yeah. But really, well, how do you check that my husband was getting a $500 hair shake after every game? Exactly, right? You can't check. You don't know what they're getting. You don't know where that Range Rover showed up at someone else's mom in Louisiana. You look through Google Maps. I mean, kids are literally, like, to get a kid, they're dropping off cars at kids' parents, grandparents' houses. So they're doing it all the time. That's why the whole Adidas FBI scandal is coming out, and there's more to come with that. How are they dealing with transgender athletes? Transgender, yeah. they do a whole kinds of stuff for them now. I don't, have never ever dealt with one personally, so I don't, I don't know the process. So, yeah, but it's like there's like a whole waiting period of a year after they transition, and they do like a drug test and all kinds of stuff. So, an interesting phenomenon if you look at the media, uh, uh, televised sports are dropping. The numbers are mm -hmm. dropping precipitously. 
ESPN laid off a third of its wor workforce last year. And ticket sales are dropping too. Correct. And and you know when you look at an average ball game, um, uh, professional game, they're seventy five dollars a ticket. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I ten years ago maybe uh, one of my books I was. I was my publisher thought it would be a great idea. I recommended it to him that I was so sick of sports, what it had become, that I was going to write a book called The Death of Sports. And I spoke to the Yale Collegiate Invitational, and I put this out there that I knew the Yale golf coach really well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I got all these people approach me, you've got to do this book, you've got to do this book. And one of them was a guy in Texas, and I went down to see. Uh, he was telling me that in this suburban McKinney, Texas, I think the kids, these 9, 10, 11 year olds, every night, three nights a week, Every night they went skating. They were they were determined to make the, the, the profession. And they had professional coaches checking in on them. Mm -hmm. And they were going to strengthen their legs. They would go and be on, on a, you know, a, what am I talking? You know, the, I don't go to the gym. You could look at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the <laughs> treadmills, <laughs> treadmills <laughs> on, on skates <laughs> oh, to skate. strengthen their legs. And the mom and dad were driving them there three mm -hmm. nights a week to do that for three hours. And they were being approached by and I and I, and I thought that would be a perfect metaphor for exactly what's wrong with sports in America. Yeah. Not because they wanted to. Uh, or I can give you another one. The, it's in my, uh, unfortunately in the world that I love, know and love best, the professional world, the world of golf, down in Pinehurst, a guy started the USA Kids movement. And it's become worldwide famous. It's brought a lot of money to Pinehurst. Mm -hmm. Probably 2,500 kids from all over the world now show up there. Uh, golf internationally is huge. Ago, I, two years ago, I was in my buddy who owns the top golf shop in the world down there, and the, he wanted me, to meet, wanted me to meet the new 10 and under champion from New Zealand. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, so, and I know New Zealand well, I've been there a bunch. I said, well, where are you from and what do you like? And he, what do you like about golf? And he said, it's, oh, it's okay, but he calls me dad. And mm -hmm. I said, so, uh, what do you, this is the home of golf, Pinehurst, what do you think? And he goes, I'm going swimming. I love the swimming pools. Mm -hmm. And that's we're not we letting kids. Kid. No, kids, exactly. Kids aren't allowed to be kids anymore. Good story. My cousin, who is about four inches taller than me and built like a brick house, went to St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia and played. That is my family school. I'm the only one that didn't go there. So um, Phil Martelli just got fired from basketball, right? So um, she got there, and I live right across the river in New Jersey, and she's, it's October 30th, so practice is 15 days in now, right? Freshman year. Full scholarship, play basketball there. She calls me. She's like, I need to talk to you. And this is the kid that missed days at the shore, couldn't go to Great Adventure, all these things. And I kept telling my aunt and uncle, and I'm good 10, 12. I'm like, let her be a kid. Let her be a kid. I did not. I said, I made college athletics fine. She doesn't need to be at every AU tournament every weekend, every summer, right? So by the time I get there, she's in tears. She's like, I hate this. I don't want to be here. And I don't. This don't go on because they end up yeah, hating, the sport. hating it. And I, mean, I said, I will go with you. I will drive you home to tell your mom and dad, right? And she's like, I can't do that. Can I just stay with you? I'm like, you're not staying with me, right? <laughs> so I drive her to Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. We walk in to my aunt and uncle. It's crazy. My aunt's six one. My uncle's five seven. So, and we sit down and we tell them. And I could have went like, I told you so. And I'm like. Let her take a year off. Let her figure out what she wants to do. She doesn't know what she wants to do, right? So she wanted to take a year off, and then she went to community college for a year. She wanted to play in softball. So, and she played at Keene in New Jersey. It's a D3 school, okay? But she would never, she would never picked up a basketball again. Mm. That is sad. And, and just so that you don't think it's so bad just in the United States, uh, the Olympic gold, I had her speak at a conference we had the other day. She was taking a little whip from her home at nine years old mm -hmm. uh, and, and had to live on the camp. Didn't see her parents again until after she won a gold medal. Uh, didn't even know who they were at the, from the time she was eight years old to 16 when she won a gold medal. Mm -hmm. Was never at home. Our, our soccer is a perfect example. Our United States women's soccer team used to dominate. If you just noticed when they played the past three weeks, did they dominate, ladies? Did you watch the games? No, we're losing. We're losing that fight in, in soccer because all these other countries are out to beat the United States. So. Yeah. No, they've always not been very good. So. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah. So there's a lot of things wrong with a lot of different things. So.
but a lot of it has to do with ethics. So, well, thank you. Thank you. We have come to the end of our formal presentation, but Dr. Keller will be here. There, there are some refreshments, and if you would please complete the evaluation I'm back. Thank you so much. that's in your program. And Dr. Keller, we have a, a tradition. Where I get the we, pick. We do